hard to read into it, Paul, in many respects, because they are without so many players. Um, and, and you mentioned some of the marquee names that have been missing uh, so far. They had all those injuries through the league campaign. I, I suspect, and, and you lads would be more of okay with what the opinion is in the county right now, but I suspect that they're reasonably happy with where they're at, given that they, they had all those injuries to retain their Division One status. Okay, they mightn't have been overly impressive in too many of the matches, but they got there and got the job done. And, you know, I don't think uh, making a league final was, was a big deal for the likes of Galway this year. Um, I do think that outside of the Kerry, Derry, Dublin kind of top three, I do think the Galway are the best place when they have everyone available, fit and, and, and healthy, that they're the best place to make a tilt at winning the All-Ireland. I think they have the talent, they have the forwards, um, and, and they've got the little bit of experience laced throughout the squad as well. So I do think if we're looking for someone outside those top three who are, you know, I would say are probably the top three in the country right now. I think Galway are the next best. Um, so I'm sure that they're open to kind of come to the boil now over the next couple of weeks, starting with this weekend. Uh, so, you know, I'm really interested to see how they go because 2022 feels like quite a while ago now that All-Ireland final when they got a little bit close to be disappointed with last year. So it's a big, big year for them. But I- the Maroon and White Pod brought to you by CityLink. For bookings, timetables, updates and any other information, head to citylink.ie. You're welcome along to the Maroon and White pod. This week we're looking ahead to Goa versus Sligo in the Connacht semi-final uh, where it now takes place in Markovic Park. It's not streamed um, on GA Go, won't be on RT or Anton over the weekend so you pretty much have to be there or be listening in on the radio to hear Anton about this match. But Barry, coming to you first... Is the game in the right venue this weekend? Well, it is for Sligo. Um, oh, yeah, look, I, I think I, I think the general sense after the game was that, that the game would be in Markbridge Park. Um, you know, and Galway have accepted that, I think, without too much fuss. Um, and that would be Porrick's style. I, I, I don't think he would have, you know, he doesn't like a lot, an awful lot of distraction. Um, but they, you know, they went, they were in London this week or last week and, you know, they would have been focusing fully on, on hitting to Markfish Park on Sunday. And, and, um, I think for Tony McEntee, he, he made it clear after the Leitrim game that he fully expected the game to be there. And I, I don't think he, like, I don't think a manager puts himself in that position if he has any doubts over where the game is going to be. You know, he, he wouldn't leave himself, um, open to any sort of as I said distraction. So I think he probably he probably had the inside track. He knew the game was going to be Markovic and uh it is where it is now and all roads lead to Sligo for, for, for the weekend and hopefully we get good weather and uh good scenery and good football. Well after last year's hammering really the Sligo got in the comic final, are you happy to see the game take place in Markovic Park? Maybe just to even things out slightly. Ah, yeah, definitely. I think home advantage is always key, and particularly Markovic Park. It tends to be a, a tough place for teams to go. Um, Sligo had a couple of good results there in the league. They beat Westmead, which was probably the standout result for them in the last round of the league in Markovic. And, you know, generally speaking, they tend to be quite difficult to beat there. Now, the last time the goal we were down, I think it was um, was a 2019. They, they won fairly comfortably. Now, Sligo were at quite a low ebb that time. I don't think they won a game in, in 2019 in the league or championship. But, you know, I think there's um, not an air of confidence, but I think there's a, a hope that Sligo can certainly lay a glove or two on goal with this weekend. Whatever about winning the game, I think Sligo are in a good position to, to have a crack at it. And the fact that it's in Markovic as well should help them in, in closing down that gap. But still, I mean, regardless of where the game is going to be played, Paul, it's going to be goal with huge, huge favourites, I think. How do you see this game on Saturday, Barry? Um. Yeah, like, firstly, I I don't think the venue has anything to do with uh, the game being ev- evened up a little bit. Um, Galway were you know by far and away the better team last year, no doubts about it. Played some really really good football. Had one of the great kind of final performances of Matthew Tierney. But there's no Matthew Tierney this weekend. There's also no Damien Comer. There's also no Ian Burke. There's no Peter Cook. Possibly no John Maher, possibly no Shane Walsh, and no Killian McDaid. Take them out of any team, and it evens things up big time. And I think for Sligo and Tony McEntee, if 
if they're ever going to have a cut at one of the top teams, they've had a nice win over Leitrim. They had a really relatively good league campaign, mid table division three. Never in any doubt that they were, you know, going to hold their own division three. Uh, lots of good young players coming through. Yeah, they're down a couple of bodies, but this is a weekend. I'm not. I'm not saying Sligo are going to win. I I still expect Galway to win, but if Sligo are ever going to have a crack at one of the top teams in in the province, it has to be this weekend. And if it isn't, I personally, if I was in Tony McEntee's boots, I'd be very disappointed with that. Does that give you hope, Cahill, this weekend? Yeah, as I say, I think Sligo will be quietly confident that they can uh, lay a glove on Galway this weekend. Um, you know, the, the league campaign, they're probably looking back at the Division 3 campaign, maybe a small bit disappointed that they didn't actually get promotion. If you go back to the first day, they lost narrowly to Clare, down in Clare by a point and kind of a frantic finish. Uh, they were soundly beaten by down and they drew it awfully, but there was lots of good stuff in the league uh, all the way through. The young players coming through, Clannis Mulligan has emerged, particularly in the last couple of weeks against Westmeath and then was really, really good against Leitrim in the Championship. Now he's going to be really tested this weekend if he starts in the middle of the park where Galway have a lot of experienced bodies. Um, but it is an opportunity and I think, you know, with the the young players that Sligo have coming through now, hopefully over the next three or four years from the good under 20 and minor teams, you would be hopeful and probably expecting, you know, if we can get those guys through, that Sligo can start to compete a little bit better with Mayo, Galway and Roscommon. It's a while since we've had a, a statement win. If you, I probably have to go back to probably 2015 when, when Sligo beat Roscommon in Markovic uh, and then subsequently got hammered by Mayo in the final. You know, it's that long ago since Sligo made a dent in the provincial championship and it's probably time now that the county started to to contend a small bit better in, in the provincial championship which I think is a realistic goal um, so for me I think if they can certainly hang in there against Galway at the weekend for 45-50 minutes and make it competitive coming down the stretch that'll be progress after that heavy defeat last year in Castlebar Just as a supporter Gal, when Tony McEntee says after the game that it's not impossible but that it's unlikely against Galway how does that make you feel as a Sligo supporter when you're hearing that before you go into a game? Well, look, I mean, I think the things have moved on from maybe where they were, you know, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, that there is a dis- distinct gap between the top teams in the country. You look at Dublin and Mead there at the weekend in Croke Park, and maybe that's at the, the upper end of the scale. Dublin were the, the best teams of all time, but there's no question that the Mayos and Galways of this world and Connacht have been head and shoulders above the likes of Leitrim and Sligo. I don't think that's... Uh, controversial to say that but I do think that Sligo should be a little bit more bullish about their chances going forward in the next number of years as I say with those younger players coming through and um, traditionally Galway are a team that you know back in the 90s I think there were a couple of draws between the two counties certainly uh, Barry will remember probably back 07 uh, 2010 2012 Sligo managed to to beat Galway in those years and, and the games that they didn't win tended to be reasonably close um, so traditionally Sligo maybe have have managed to to take Galway out of it in, the, in terms of the Connacht Championship on a couple of occasions. Um, I'm not sure it's realistic to be going in this weekend expecting to win, but I think it is realistic to win and expect to be really, really competitive. Uh, and, you know, hopefully they can produce a performance that would certainly give them something if it's not going to be a win, that they can take plenty from it heading into to hopefully uh, a productive Talton Cup campaign later in the summer. What's your own memories there, Barry, from playing Sligo, as Carl mentions some of those games? Yeah, look, uh, some of them good, some of them not so good. Um, obviously, Connacht final 07 was a standout bad memory. Um, but the defining factor on that was, um, Sligo had like some absolutely outstanding players in those days. Like you know, starting off like the likes of Philip Green and Gold, Charlie Harrison, Eamon O'Hara, Mark Brehany, uh, David Kelly, like players that would make any team in the country. They were they were outstanding. Yeah, we were probably very much in a transitional period, having gone maybe lost some of the, the real uh marquee players and in Goa teams over the early two thousands, but you know, we certainly never got anything anything easy against Sligo primarily because they they're really, really good players. Um I I I just touch on on the Tony McEntee thing, I, I thought that was a really, personally I thought it was a terrible thing to say. And like, particularly if you're looking someone like the Callis Mulligan, who he has, he has absolutely no fear of Gala. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and there's a big difference between Meath and Dublin in that 
you know, me th- haven't really been producing a huge amount at schools or underage level, where you'd have to say the the top performing county in Connacht in terms of underage and schools over the last couple of years is Sligo. And, you know, for someone not from Sligo to turn around and, and kind of dismiss their chances against Galway at the weekend following what you'd have to say has been a relatively successful period, particularly at schools level, over Galway teams, I think I think was silly. Now, maybe he was trying to stir something for his own players, but I'd have to say that that... As I said, just taking Callis Mulligan as an example, if 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 you're your first year in, in the Sligo senior team coming off the back of good success at underage levels where they don't fear Galway and your senior manager is basically telling you you're not going to win, I'd, I'd have huge question marks over that one, I must say. Yeah, it's an interesting one um, to see. Is he stirring something within the group or is that what he genuinely thinks? I guess we won't know that, but... Uh, Carl, just on Galway so far this year, uh, mixed league campaign, comfortable victory against London, and um, to score five goals was huge. But what have you met of them so far this year? Well, it's it's probably hard to read into it, Paul, in many respects because they are without so many players. Um, I, and and you mentioned some of the marquee names that have been missing uh, so far. They had all those injuries through the league campaign. I I suspect, and and you lads would be more of what's what the opinion is in the county right now but I suspect that they're reasonably happy with where they're at given that they, they had all those injuries to retain their Division 1 status okay they mightn't have been overly impressive in too many of the matches but they got there and got the job done and you know I don't think uh, making a league final was was a big deal for the likes of Galway this year um, I do think that outside of the Kerry, Derry, Dublin kind of top three I do think the Galway are the best placed when they have everyone available fit and, and, and healthy that they're the best place to make a tilt at winning the All-Ireland. I think they have the talent, they have the forwards um, and, and they've got a little bit of experience laced throughout the squad as well. So I do think if we're looking for someone outside those top three who are, you know, I would say are probably the top three in the country right now, I think Galway are the next best. Um, so I'm sure that they're open to kind of come to the boil now over the next couple of weeks starting with this weekend. Uh, so, you know, I'm really interested to see how they go because 2022 feels like quite a while ago now that all Ireland final when they got a little bit close to be disappointed with last year so it's a big big year for them but I do think they have the tools when everyone's available to to make a proper goal at the all Ireland later this year. And obviously Barry we can't read too much into London because uh, the space and time goal I got in the ball they're not going to get that again this year but did you see an improvement in their performance? Um. Yeah I, I like yeah, obviously, yeah, they were apps. Like you look at maybe some of the scores and the goals they got, and um, how clinical they were, and you'd have to say there was an improvement in their performance. But that is because they were coming from playing. You know, their last game was against Kerry, Derry, Dublin, Mayo, to London, and that's no disrespect to London. If there wasn't a really improved aspect of their performance, then then you'd have to uh, you'd certainly have to question it. But but even you know, then on the maybe the stuff that might worry you is is that you know the injury to John Maher and the lead up to it. I think that's another hamstring from what I hear. Tom O'Callaghan hamstring. It just you would wonder like what what factors are feeding into all these kind of soft tissue injuries that Galway are getting. That's really hampering hampering progress. And like I, I think Callis is a hundred percent. Or I think Carl is a hundred percent right in in his assessment of, of Galway being one of the teams that could push into that top three bracket if they have everyone. But unfortunately, we don't have everyone. And, you know, it would be lovely if we were to see some guys on the Jack Lynn trajectory where he saw some action in the league, you know, then started against London, will start the next day against Sligo and ease his way back in and hopefully be at the pitch of it against uh, in a con final. Please God, we, we get there. But you know, we don't see that. Like we, you know, I know Shane, um, of a, a well placed source. Uh, I won't give it away now, but that said that Galway played Kerry and and Shane Walsh played a bit of game time. So hopefully he might see some action against Sligo. But you know, it seems like Damien Comer still a bit off. So Killy McDade seems to be still a bit off. So yeah, we we need all our players at the peak of their powers for Galway to really push on. Um, I don't think we can read too much into the London game, 
but hopefully we'll see a little bit more from this weekend. Please God, get over that, and then I think yeah, a, a Connacht final is is the, the will be the real asset test for Galway. But on you know at the back of our minds always, particularly for Galway management, is that they're going to be in that knockout stages of the All Ireland Championship, and you know they could be saying to themselves, yeah, right, look, we need all these bodies back. Do we need them back for a tilt to the Connacht Championship? Or do we need them back for a tilt at North Ireland? And they're probably saying, we need them back for a tilt at North Ireland and let's try and get the bodies back on the pitch for that rather than against Sligo in a Connacht semi-final. Just there you mentioned, obviously, Tom O'Callaghan, that injury isn't, from what I've heard, it isn't supposed to be as feared as it was initially. So it looks like he could be fit to play this weekend. But if he is fit, Barry, do you start him this weekend given the impact he made? In the quarter final, yeah. Look, you know, for the likes of myself and and yourself, Paul, and supporters and pundits and media, you know, we look at the cameo that he made against London. He got his two goals. I say, oh, he has to start. But like Porrick and Keen O'Neill, Scan, Divo, Michael O'Donnell, they're looking at Lock George on the Thursday. They're looking at everything that they did in London following the London game, they're looking at everything that's been happening this week and that's what they'll make a call on. A couple of minutes against London will have absolutely nothing got to do with it. Um, so what I'd say is that if he if he's performing well at training, if his work ethic and his effort and his attitude is top, top notch, then then I would give him game time. But if they're not, no more than any other player, then, then he possibly won't. But you know, you will be hoping that everything is right up there and that he gives them an option to either start or come off the bench on Saturday. How do you think Sligo are going to match up defensively here, Carl, against a couple of the goal key forwards, the likes of your Robert Finnerty's and Killian O'Carrons in particular? Yeah, I, I suppose, first of all, uh, it depends on the goal with team selection and whether you know you mentioned Shane Walsh and those guys there whether they're going to come back into contention um, I think that Sligo probably will detail Nathan Mullen probably to man mark Galway's most dangerous forward whether that's Tom O'Callaghan or Finnerty or, or someone like that I think uh, Nathan had a really good game on Ryan O'Rourke against Leitrim he did similar in Pork Sean last year against Keith Byrne in a key league match he's probably Sligo's uh, one of Sligo's top defenders then you've got Evan Lyons who's a, a tidy marker in the full back line as well um, I'm interested to see how Sligo approach it defensively because it's a very difficult uh, thing because obviously Galway have guys that can kick scores from range. You look at Paul Conroy back in the team now and he'll be able to dictate matters if Sligo drop too deep that leaving too much time on the ball for the likes of him to pick passes or kick scores from around the 45, particularly if there's a bit of a breeze behind Galway at any stage on, on Saturday. So I'll be interested to see how Sligo uh, take that on. And even defensively against Leitrim, I thought it was noticeable that um, particularly into the breeze in the second half, now it was a gale force breeze, but Sean Carabine played quite deep. He was named to start at midfield. He wore number eight. Uh, Niall Murphy, who was Sligo's best forward on the day and, and looks really, really sharp, which is encouraging from a Sligo point of view. But he also dropped quite deep into the wind as well. Um, so I'm sure that, that Tony McEntee and Joe Kane and the Sligo management team will, will have a game plan in place. Obviously, they'll have to be a small little bit more conservative against a Galway team playing in Division 1 and you know with the quality of forwards that they have. But I think Sligo have the opportunity to hurt Galway at the other end as well with the likes of Murphy, Sean Carabine. I think uh, they're as good a forward as you'll find anywhere in the province. And Sligo have a lot of pace, uh, particularly coming from that half-back line as well. Nathan Mullen got forward to kick two scores the last day, as well as Mark and Ryan O'Rourke at the other end. So I do think Sligo have the opportunity to hurt Galway at the other end, but they will obviously have to be maybe a little bit more conservative in dropping bodies back in behind the ball the next day. Does Sean Kelly really do pose a huge threat now for Sligo, particularly when he's further up the pitch for Galway now? Yes, being the short answer, yeah. Obviously, I think did Galway score four of their five goals against London into the wind in the second half, if if memory serves, and a lot of good running off the shoulder and stuff like that. Um, you know, look, Sean Kelly is one of the top players in the country. Um, I'm not sure how Sligo will go about tracking him. Maybe Nathan Mullins is the man to go on him around 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 the middle third, um, or whether you come back and and drop bodies in behind the ball and and kind of stifle that Galway run instead of trying to go man-to-man on the mount of fields. Um, but it, look, at I mean, Galway are going to have threats from all over the park. Uh, there's no question about it. And, and they have put up some big scores against Sligo in recent years. I think 2018, they put up a huge score in, in Pierce Stadium. They scored 3-11, I think, the last time they were down in Markovic. 
and obviously last year two twenty in the in the Connacht final. So they have the the capabilities to really trouble Sligo on the scoreboard. So I'd be hopeful that Sligo have moved on a little bit in terms of their defensive structure and and hopefully retain ball from their own kickouts as well. Um, and and retaining possession is going to be really crucial because if you give Galway ball on the turnover, they're really going to damage you with the pace that they have with the likes of Sean Kelly around the middle. Around the half borderline barrier, it's been interesting the approach Galway went with uh, Johnny Heaney and Carl Sweeney as your modern day wing forwards up and down, um, contributing with scores and work off the ball. Keen Darcy playing at 11 but dropping deep. Is that something you see Galway sticking with this weekend? Uh, yeah, certainly. I think Johnny Heaney and Carl Sweeney are kind of tailor-made for those two roles, aren't they? And both have experience playing in the backs, both have experience playing in the forwards. Uh, Johnny Heaney is invaluable to Galway. Um, he knows the Galway system inside out and he contributes in his, communic- his communication side of it, just getting guys organised and he's very, very likely to pop up with a score, be the goal or a point. And Carl Sweeney is developing, fastly developing into like one of Galway's top, top footballers. And again, like like Johnny, he has loads of attributes, both defensively and, and offensively. Keane Darcy, I think against Sligo now, uh, you know, Sean Carabine's big man, but I'm, I'm not sure, like even if you look at Candice Mulligan, like he's not the biggest in the world, um, and I think it. I think Galway might look and try and target Keane Darcy as being a primary possession winner, particularly when Conor Gleeson has such a a good thump in the ball that it might try and, uh, you know, if if Sligo does decide to put a full press on a Galway kick out, I think Galway might have an advantage there in having the likes of Keane Darcy and Paul Conroy. I think they might have a physical edge over over the Sligo lads. Um, so I think I think Keane Darcy will start. Will will he be there? You know, come the championship, quite possibly, and he quite possibly might just drift, find himself naturally falling into one of the midfield berths and and looking at a midfield trio of of kind of John Maher, Paul Conroy, and and Keane Darcy, and kind of fight it out for who who partners Paul Conroy and then Killian McDade hopefully will come back into the mix. So having Keane back is a great it's a great addition to Galway. He's a very good attitude, a good guy around the place. Sorry, just there uh, sorry, because I know he worked with Keane at under twenty one level, but what is it about his attitude? Because you can even see during the league there, he was just given forty minutes some days and he just emptied himself and there was no more and there was no whinging after he was given 30 or 40 minutes in some games. Yeah, you just you summed it up there. He just he's a, he's a, he's honest. He gives you everything. He's easy to talk to, he's easy to coach. He you know, if Paul Joyce told Keen Darcy to go in corner forward and stand on top of his head, he get yeah, that's that's his job. He'll go and do it and guys like that around the place are invaluable and um in the dressing room he's good. He gets on with everyone and guys even I'm not saying for for Keane Darcy, but like in a senior inter county panel, if you've guys like that, you know, every county panel has a certain amount of players that probably won't see any game time, be it league or championship and uh primarily championship. And you need those guys to be still really positive contributors around the place. And, you know, Keane has seen loads of game time, but even if he wasn't he would still be a positive contributor around the place and, and they're vital. And, you know, if you have a guy's niggling away in the background that might be kind of unhappy or causing problems or doing a bit of moaning or bitching, you, you don't need those. And uh, as I said, Keane, Keane certainly isn't one of those and playing for goal, it means a lot to him. And he uh, he's a, a really, really top guy, yeah. Just on Saturday, then, Carl. What kind of game do you expect here? Well, I expect Sligo to try and keep it quite contained as much as they can, uh, particularly in the first half. Now, conditions have played a big part in the first two weekends of the championship. And, you know, last weekend, um, the wind and stuff like that makes a big difference. And Markovic Park tends to be a ground where there will be a bit of wind uh, blowing maybe into the the dressing room end goal. Um, you know, I, I from a Sligo point of view, I'd be hoping that they can keep it tight and, and that they can contain Galway. I think not conceding any goals, particularly in the first half, just to have themselves in there at half time will be key. 
Um, you know, if, if space does open up and the, and the game opens up in the, in the second half, both teams have some really good forwards on the pitch. I'd be hoping that's from a Sligo point of view that they can get the ball to, to Sean Carabine and Niall Murphy. Um, Alan McLaughlin's another player that's come into the team from, from St. Mm-hmm. Melosh Gale, a really good underage player for Sligo um, over the years. And, and he's a player that can kick scores from distance as well. Um, but yeah, from a Sligo point of view, I think certainly if they can keep themselves competitive for 45, 50 minutes and be in the mix with 20 minutes to go, I think that'd be a, a really good outcome. And, you know, I think a Sligo are there and they will have a little bit of belief uh, going into this and they they will, even if Tony McEntee is saying one thing uh, to reporters, I think he'd be saying maybe something else to the players. And I certainly know that the players will feel that they can, they can really push this at the weekend. And I think if they're there with 20 minutes to go, home crowd behind them, and that little bit of belief, having held Galway for that long, and Galway maybe without some of their marquee players, that that it could get tricky for for Galway coming down the stretch. At least that's what we're we're hoping for, for from a Sligo point of view. But I do think that if Sligo can keep it tight up until then, and they can, it opens up a small bit that their forwards can do a little bit of damage in the closing stretch. Barry, just something we haven't touched on from a Galway perspective: Niall Murphy and Sean Carbine playing a lot of their football at the moment uh, in the forward for Sligo, but the, the two key matchups ups Galway are going to have to shut down from the start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to take a little bit of discipline in that I expect Sligo to use, like they have really, really good pace. Um, just looking at the highlights of their game against Leitrim, like a lot of their scores came from you know, turnovers where they broke and they broke at pace, the guys off the shoulder kick some good scores. And I would say that would be their game plan. Like, in fairness to them last year, they tried to come out against Galway and they tried to play football and it was a bit open and, like, they just leaked scores at the back. And I think what they'll be trying to do this year, is, as as Cahill alluded to, is keeping it very tight, getting a lot of bodies back and really trying to catch goal in the counter-attack. So if you're the likes of Sean Fitzgerald, you know, if you're picking up Sean Carabine, or if Johnny McGrath is picking up Niall Murphy, or Jack Lynn picking up Niall Murphy, how far do you actually go to put a squeeze on them if they get a turnover without leaving yourself exposed at the back if they break the first line of defence? So tactically, it'll be very interesting because, you know, and it'll be a good test for Galway in that how can they pick apart the Sligo team as I, you know, as we said that we think are trying to go to keep it very compact at the back. A lot of Galway forwards are inexperienced, um, and that's why it will take the communication of the Paul Conroy, the Johnny Heaney's, and that kind of uh, movement up top of Rob Finnerty to try and pick open the Sligo defence. And as I said, defensively for Galway, it's how far do they push that they can actually have an impact in the game not clogging things up or just getting bodies up there for the sake of it without leaving themselves exposed at the back and that's the I suppose that's why they have uh, you know that that's why Porrick and his management team are there they're there to try and get that plan in place and get it in place in a in a correct manner A lot depends Barry you feel on how Goa approach this if they're on it from the start they they want to put this game uh, to bed as quickly as possible because if the Sligo crowd um, get behind he get behind the Sligo team here and the game was on for longer, it turns into a bit of a banana skin. But like if Galway to come out of this, it's big for the group considering everyone we said they're missing. It's a step up from the London game and then they found themselves in a comic final with maybe in the league at the start of the year, the year didn't look as good. Yeah, 100%. And... and... As you said, they need to be on it from the start. Be patient. You know, even though they're a massive win last year, you know, it didn't happen automatically for them that they went out and went, you know, five or six points up straight away. Uh, they need to be clinical. They will get goal chances. You know, that power and pace that's in Division One football will see them get chances, and they need to be trying to be clinical. Um, I think for Galway. The big thing is that if they do get a goal or if they get a bit of a dominant period that they try and make hay and they get another score, you know, that, that old like four point goal, try and get a try and get a goal and, and then get the next score on top of that. Whereas for Sligo, what happened last year a bit was, you know, they were being competitive and then Galway would get a score. You know, Galway might get another one that would just put it beyond Sligo. And then Sligo would be competitive again and then Galway might get another goal. And then 
you know, it just puts the game the game out of reach. So I'd say for Galway, it's build. First of all, if they get a goal chance, be clinical, build on that goal chance. And then for Sligo, it's if Galway do happen to get a goal that, you know, they don't concede the next score. And I think that's always important when you have a team, you know, that's that's in Division 3 against a team that's, that's in Division 1. How do you see it going, Carl? Well, I think I think Sligo can be really competitive, as I was saying. I think I think they can keep it competitive for for fifty minutes, and then you're kind of hoping that they've got enough momentum and energy at that point to sustain it for the the final twenty. Um, a lot depends on Sligo's efficiency. I think they kicked a lot of bad wides against Leitrim in the last day. They had the wind in the first half, and it took a little bit of while just to to get the radar in. Obviously, they won't have as many chances this weekend, so they need to be more efficient. But I, I do think Sligo are in a good place to to really challenge Galway this weekend, particularly the fact that Galway are without some some key players. I think it might be a stretch given the gap that was between the teams last year to suggest that Sligo can can win here. But I do think that they can be within a shouting distance with, with 15 or 20 minutes left to go. Galway might squeeze through by by four or five. I'd be hoping that Sligo can keep it that tight uh, with, with 20 minutes to go that they're in with a shout. But it's, I think it's hard to suggest anything other than a, a Galway win. But I would be quite... Quietly hopeful that Sligo can can mount a really good performance here, and and you know who knows in Championship football what might happen if they're in the mix uh, when the game's in the melting pot. But but I would suggest that the Galway probably do have enough um, with their physicality, with the experience of playing Division One football, uh, and with the fact that they they've got such a strong squad and a bit of depth in their squad now that they, they should pull through even without those key players. Do you think Sligo can win this weekend? I do. I think it's a very slim chance, but I think uh, you always have to have hope. Um, and particularly, you know, with the, the momentum that they've built up, they're under Tony McEntee now for, for a number of years. They've got a, a pretty set system. Um, there is a, a confidence coming into football in the county now, given the underage success uh, of the last few years, that that things are on the up. Um, our under-20 team have done really, really well to lift the fortunes of the county. There's a a new interest. I think now a lot of those under 20 players have still to come through to the senior setup, but they will gradually come in over the next number of years. Uh, and Candice Mulligan is leading that at the moment. But I do think that Sligo can win. I think it's a very slim chance. I think Galway will have to underperform. Sligo will have to play probably the best they've played under Tony McEntee to, to be there with a chance. But th- there's always a chance in Championship football, I think. And Barry, why do you see Galway having too much this weekend? Yeah, I do. Um, I think it'll be tighter, much, much tighter than it was last year. And I think Sligo will have learned lots of lessons from last year. Um, and and I'm not going to go back to all the guys that go we are missing, but, but that's a big factor. Um, I would see it maybe 10 minutes into the second half. It's still been a couple of points in it. And you would hope that Galway's... Uh, Greater physical power and pace and strength will get them over the line in that, and I and I and I think it will. Um, I think it'd be a very good test for the younger fellas, the Kidino Koreans and these guys. So again, it'll be a big step up from from what they faced against London, um, and a great learning curve for them. Um, then hopefully we get one or two guys back to see some game time, and we can kick on kick on from there. But it'll certainly it'll certainly be a good contest. Um, anyone that does make the trip down, I think it'd be well worth the well worth the hour and a half down the road and the the entrance fee. I think Sligo will be very very competitive. They'll try and play a good brand of football. There'll be loads of pace, loads of good scores. I just think coming down the stretch, Galway will have a little bit too much power for them. And um, I, I have a funny feeling that like he was excellent again against London. I think Paul Conroy will have a big big say in this game because you know. As as Cahill suggested, like when Sligo try and shore things up at the back, it could leave loads of space for him out around the middle of the pitch, and uh, no better fella to to expose that if a team allows him time and time and space, he'll he'll uh, he'll certainly make hay, and could be a big game for him. Good stuff. That's all uh, we do have time for on today's podcast. Uh, so that's go in Sligo in the Connacht semi final on Saturday. The winner plays Mayo or Oscommon in the Connacht final in two weeks' time. But lads, thanks a million for coming on.